jazz musicians, I salute you in these strange, strange times where we're all forced to stay at home. The upside is that we probably have a lot of time to practice and pick up some stuff that's long overdue. For me, uh, that also contained making this video about some stuff, some tools I came up with while I was doing my master's degree two years ago. And uh, I was researching the intellectual legacy of trumpeter Woody Shaw, one of my great heroes. And I came up with some tools to translate his uh, harmonic choices and his knowledge into some new jazz language. So I just wanted to put some stuff online. Maybe there's something in it for you, maybe not. If you, maybe you disagree with some stuff, please uh, comment below this video. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to put it online. And, uh, maybe there's something in it for you. So let me know and uh, yeah, let's go. Switching to a, a voice recorder now to make the editing easier later. For me, the main reason to return to a musical institution to, uh, in order to obtain my master's degree, even though it had already been 10 years after completing my bachelor in 2006, was that I felt like bumping into an imaginary ceiling uh, in my improvisations, which maybe is something fellow musicians can identify with. I knew I wanted to break through some walls harmonically to feel more free with taking steps beyond the functional harmony of chords, but I lacked the knowledge or structures to do so, therefore the attempts I did make seemed to miss their targets and just made me sound like I was lost, which I probably often was. Now, I had always admired the harmonic freedom jazz trumpeter Woody Shaw seemed to have obtained. In my observation, he could just go anywhere harmonically and melodically and still make it sound like it was the only same thing to do at that point. Well, it felt like a good investment to really dive into this material for two years straight in order to find some guidelines to further develop my playing. So I decided to join forces with an expert on Shaw's intellectual legacy, Jarmo Hogendijk, the number one jazz trumpeter of the Netherlands, until an injury forced him to stop playing around the age of 40. Jarmo had even lived together with Woody for a few months and had absorbed all he could about his playing. So with him as my teacher, I thought I was good to go. The contemplated research stages in short, as you're supposed to start with according to the research handbook we were handed out. Well, at the start of my thesis, I think my jazz language was mostly based on the bebop tradition, but I had recently started looking into some patterns with wider intervals like perfect fourth and fifths, trying to literally open up the sound of my jazz language. Well, as you can see in the overview, my research goal was to modernize, which I realize is a bit of a silly word when talking about jazz, while for instance, bebop was considered quite modern when it first came up. But let's say modernize my jazz language with newly created content, inspired on the legacy of Woody Shaw. The first important thing worth mentioning is that it had always been my goal to, like the title of my thesis, preserve Woody Shaw's musical fire and taking it into the future by making an interpretation of his jazz language and the people he listened to, and then adding a new twist to it, making it into a new uh, original content. It had never been my goal to just literally copy him because that's not adding value, that's simply repeating history. Furthermore, nobody can play his stuff better than him, right? So why bother? I wanted to create new content that felt right for me, in other words, also, please don't just copy what I do if you don't feel it. Second worth, uh, thing worth mentioning is that when you are looking for a more modern approach of your improvising by looking at someone like Woody Shaw or maybe someone like Michael Brecker, for example, realize that they also just started with bebop and took it from there. As also stated by uh, trumpeter Alex Sipiagin, who I interviewed for my thesis. That's what's most important. That's what some people don't get at the beginning. They start to play some outside harmony like Woody Shaw, but they don't realize, man, Woody, Woody started from, from from very basic stuff, and then gradually went to this uh, out, you know, um, a, a tonal or whatever territories. Mm -hmm. 
To me, this pointed out the fact that I shouldn't be starting a new thing from scratch, but start from and build on the knowledge that I already owned. So generally, I think when whenever you are going to research one of your jazz heroes in order to enrich your own jazz language, determine your starting point by simply saying, what do I know so far about the stuff I'm looking into? You always have some foreknowledge, for example, uh, example due to listening to their music a lot, which apparently triggered you to start digging deeper or reading interviews or reading articles. Make an inventory of what you know so far and make that the starting point of your research. The knowledge I had before starting my research was that I heard Woody combine and intertwine multiple tonal modes to step beyond the functional harmony of chords, which I called polytonality. He often did this in pentatonic patterns. Uh, the use of pentatonic patterns was something he picked up from John Coltrane. Bobby Shue once told me this anecdote. He said Randy Brecker once bumped into Woody outside a jazz club and asked him what he was carrying under his arm. Woody showed him a pile of Coltrane records that appeared on the Impulse label and said, well, that's my Bible. So if he took it that serious, then so should I. So there it was, more stuff for me to check out. While reading some articles about Woody Shaw, I also found out that he was inspired by multiple classical composers like Sultan Kodali, but also Béla Bartók, especially regarding the use of perfect fourth intervals. I think it was an article written by trumpeter Sean Jones that, among other things, spoke about the period that Woody joined Eric Dolphy's band in his early 20s. When the two of them would study Bartók scores during daytime in order to look for a new language or sound to f that fitted Dolphy's new music, well, more research for me, listening to the music of uh, Bartok and looking at full scores. Where I found out another musical aspect I thought was nice to try to involve into my research, symmetry. I had not yet seen or heard anything symmetrical in Woody's playing. I thought, okay, let's add something new too. It felt like a new twist, but in the spirit of Woody's legacy, which uh, who also made his own in interpretation of Bartok, of course. So at this stage, I thought, okay, this is more than uh, enough to start off with. Let's go with these four ingredients for now. In line of starting with what you already know, in the period before diving into this stuff, I was having a lot of fun practicing pentatonics. For one, I liked the sound and playability of it. Plus, it gave me an alternative to bebop skills when soloing during pop gigs, for example. So before I was playing exercises like the top one here, which basically is just a scale. But during the first months of my research, I started practicing patterns like the bottom one, which my teacher Yarmo found in his notes of his own studies on Woody. It's still pentatonics, but the perfect fourth intervals make it sound more open. Again, it's just taking material you already master and adapting it to the new territories you want to discover. By the way, also look up Ricci Vitale on YouTube if you like this stuff. He also has a bunch of these patterns for you, including this one, by the way. In this early stage of research, it also felt like the right moment to further develop some patterns uh, that Yarmo had given me in the past, with perfect fourth intervals, like this one right here. I thought the least I could start with is to look some ways to uh, apply them on 2-5-1 sequences, like the top one, descending a major second. <laughs> descending a major third, effectively hitting alterations. The field of possibilities of this material is quite extensive because you can make all kinds of inversions into exercises, getting used to these bigger intervals. And then what's stopping you from making rhythmic variations and adaptations to also fit them on chord sequences like we did before. A bit later in this video I will also briefly talk about what I call the grey area when constructing patterns like these. But as a little prequel, in this particular line you see one off note, the C sharp or D flat what have you, in the second bar has no place in D7 altered. However, due to the very clear direction of the phrase, to my opinion you will get away with this as a guide note or a passing note because the direction of the pattern is so clear and transparent but again gray area so more on that later 
After practicing these patterns for a while, it became time to start involving some direct Woody Shaw references too. Now what I had often hear Woody do on 251 sequences is approach it with ascending major modes. So in a G minor C7 F sequence, he would start with F over G minor, then F sharp over C7, hitting all those alterations, and sometimes uh, even continuing it further to G over F, making it sharp 11, like this example. So with that clear reference, I did the same with my perfect fourth interval patterns and hit all those alterations too. Now this started to sound cool to me already, more open due to the bigger intervals than my bebop skills. And look at the note material, it's still just material from the pentatonic scale, but we've totally changed and transformed the sound of it now. All right, I was in my practice room having a ball with this pentatonic stuff to a point where I thought, okay, now what about the bi and polytonality? Can I make patterns of that too? I started an experiment by looking for two modes that had some harmonic distance from each other in order to create an harmonic clash. Now, I had been practicing a lot in minor keys that period, so I picked G minor and C sharp minor. Distant, but not so distant, you know what I mean? Because of the tritone relationship. All right, now bear with me. I wanted to start by making patterns of four groups of four notes in what sounded like the strongest harmonic framework to me, which was inside, outside, inside. It was my hypothesis that by both starting and ending your pattern within the functional harmony of a chord, you create a framework for the listener's ear from within. You could tapes, take steps beyond. As long as you demonstrate your acknowledgement of the chord, you are playing the pattern over. In my opinion, a lot, of, a lot is justified. It's then up to the player to A, really mean what he's playing. Like Bobby Shu used to point out to me during my research, first be able to hear it before you play it. To make it B, sound convincing. So that was my basic framework for this experiment, to which I wanted to add some ingredients I picked up of uh, Bartok's compositions too, being the use of perfect fourth intervals and symmetry. I figured I could probably, slash hopefully, create some patterns by giving each node a number and then trying to apply various kinds of symmetry. So the rules for my first experiment were divided into two categories, hard rules and soft rules. The hard rules should always be obeyed, like each group of four notes should contain the tonic of the contemplated mode to make that clear reference. And I always uh, also uh, wanted to avoid repetitive notes, which I assumed would take out the flow. And soft rules, with, which I mean apply when possible, try to put some perfect fourth intervals in it uh, and at least look for a playable line on trumpet with a nice flow and direction. Now, I will spare you all the failed results when I look for ways to apply symmetry, but for example, I've quickly found out that making the first and second and the third and fourth group symmetrical with each other made the pattern sound real corny, real static, and not fluent at all. It sounded like an exercise, which was definitely not the goal. But along the way, I found out that if I made the first and third and second and fourth group symmetrical with each other, suddenly some nice lines started to come out, like this example right here. The top line is an eight note phrase I constructed first, using my rules of experiment with some perfect fourth intervals in it, and each group of four notes containing the tonic of its mode. To me, this felt like a nice fluent phrase that, and in the second half also sounded like a real decisive step beyond the functional harmony of G minor which was my starting point and therefore the harmonic consonants. All right, so now the symmetrical aspect I wanted to add. I gave each note the number, uh, their number in the contemplated mode. In other words, note F is the seven in G minor. To be able to apply symmetry later. And then group one became the reference for the yet to be created group three. And group two became the reference for group four. So just read with me, group one, F, B flat, C, G, so seven, three, four, one. So now mirror that, which makes group three, one, four, three, seven. But now in the mode of C, uh, C sharp minor, you see, same for group two, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp. So four, one, five, two. So then group four would have to be two, five, 
1, 4, but now in a mode of G minor. Now this started to sound like something cool to me. It had a basis, a foundation in interpretations of musical ancestors, but it was definitely new material. I really liked the sound of this and so, so did Jarmo and so did my thesis advisor, which made me decide, okay, I'm gonna stick with this for a while and call this strategy CSA, short for Cross Symmetric Approach. I got excited with these CSA patterns and examples started to roll out like this one right here. I created the first bar like I did with the previous example. So each group of four notes should contain a root of its mode. And I put some perfect fourth intervals in it and then use symmetry to get to bar number two. So now I had an approach to step outside the functional harmony of G minor. But how about applying that to a 2-5-1 progression, for example? Of course, the tritone relationship participated in the effectiveness of this approach, hitting the alterations, and it sounded pretty alright with me. Although with this 2-5-1 sequence, I did realize that there is a jazz rule stating that once you've started using alterations in a phrase, you cannot re return to the original note of the clean dominant until you've resolved to the first step. But nonetheless, I decided to ignore this piece because I just thought it worked so well. And on stage, it was me that was gonna play it. So it was me that was up to the task to make it sound right. Now, this will probably be the gray area in which some of you will disagree with me. And I urge you to maintain that opinion if, you, if that feels right for you. But my point of view is that when I consider something sounding good and working for me, any rule that is limiting me to do so, because I'm not supposed to, is a rule I'm happy to, to drop or at least bend. Now, before telling you this next anecdote, let me start by stating, obviously stating that I'm not by far comparing myself or these thoughts to those of Thelonious Monk. But I did always like the picture that Kenny Werner painted about Thelonious Monk when he said that during the first concerts of Monk, there must have been music theory teachers in the hall that thought, hey, what he's playing, you're not supposed to do that. But it sounds so amazing, so I may have to rethink some stuff. You know, so again, my opinion is that if something sounds right, sounds and feels right to you, and it has a clear foundation, I believe the listener's ear will accept it. Yes, you do have to respect the jazz tradition, but it's you who's talking, not what thousands did before you. Well, enough on that. After this bitonality, I went into the polytonality area. The top line here is a nice phrase that Woody keeps adapting to various chords in his solo on uh, the song Rosewood. Based on his modifications, my interpretation is that he's playing descending pentatonic modes uh, with a major third between them. Here being G, E flat, B, and then returning to G. Again, inside, going outside, and returning home again. Which of course fitted great in my harmonic framework so far. Well, when applying my CSA method on this harmonic structures, patterns like the bottom one came out. I hope it's clear what I'm trying to show here. Create a model to work with based on one or multiple characteristics or signatures of your jazz hero. Maybe add an extra twist to it, but one that you can defend is in the spirit of your hero, like I did picking out something from Bela Bartok and then put it to work for you. While all of this contains quite some harmonic clashes, here's an example closer to home, so to speak. I've mentioned before that trumpeter Bobby Shu was involved in my research, providing me with feedback on my findings. We've met in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where we were both playing a festival and for a few days we hung out within the meantime, him providing me with a lot of thoughts for my research, which I by then had just started. One of the things he told me about Woody Shaw's playing is that it was also strongly influenced by this method right here, the Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization by George Russell. It deals with the strength of the Lydian scale due to tonal gravity being built on perfect fifth intervals. Well, I won't get into detail here, but it's interesting stuff for you to check out. I think you can even download the PDF for free online. Well, I had heard would he use the Lydian scale extensively? I thought at least one pattern with a Lydian concept should be added to my findings. 
And in addition, I started making up exercises with perfect fifth intervals too. Again, just training myself to be more skilled in playing these bigger intervals as a technical exercise. Well, long story short, I used my CSA method to come up with uh, Lydian patterns too. Now here you see and hear me combining the C and D mode and in this example by also involving the sixth of the C, the phrase basically becomes an A Dorian scale. In addition to this, check out the full interview with Alexi Piagin uh, at this location. You've heard a fragment of it earlier in this video. He talks a lot about triad pairing, which can also get you to the sound of this Lydian uh, CSA pattern. I've transcribed all the examples he's playing, so it's good and clear study, yeah, studying material for you all to check out. I wanted to add an extra reference of the Woody Shaw Bela Bartok connection to my research. Now, one of my favorite Bartok compositions uh, quickly became Concerto for Orchestra, especially that string intro with all the perfect fourths. Man, that created some tension there. I wrote out the first part here. Except for one case, the minor third between C sharp and E, this intro is built on major second and perfect fourth intervals exclusively. Now that was something I also uh, saw and heard in uh, Woody Shaw's phrases. So I looked up a way of interpreting this intro in order to be able to make a model out of it. Well, I had that ingredient of the major second and perfect fourth intervals, and then I noticed that the fourth phrase could be interpreted as uh, pentatonic scales of E and C, exactly in the framework inside, outside, inside. Now, ain't that something? Again, this is an interpretation of, my, uh, of myself, and I doubt that Bartok himself constructed, him, uh, constructed it like that, but coincidence or not, it made perfect sense in the models I was making. So now I had a reference to step beyond the functional harmony of the mode of E by taking the off-ramp to the mode of C. Now, how would this sound using my CSA models? Trying to challenge myself a bit further, I wanted to see if I could also construct a CSA pattern by only using major second and perfect fourth intervals and still sound like a fluent line. Now, I have to admit this was a bit of a puzzle, but this is an example of a, to my opinion, successful one. So along the way, already halfway the second year of my master's degree, I decided to focus on a string of eight patterns I had collected, covering most areas I wanted to cover, including a uh, pattern staying within the harmonic function or consonants of the chord, in other words, without stepping outside. And the rest of my research was all about mastering the patterns in all keys, in fast tempos, and making also making sheets where I inserted multiple assignments, like this example right here, when I was solo soloing over the chords of a Woody Shaw original, Katrina Ballerina, and highlighted multiple places in the song to remind me of which of my patterns would work perfectly when implemented in my solo. Now, I want to stress this is an exercise and not the way you should be soloing on stage, of course. But I wanted to drill myself with all those possible applications to really be aware of the extensive field of possibilities of my findings. basically the stuff I wanted to share with you guys, showing you some steps I took and some decisions I made in order to come up with some new material, to practice and to integrate into my jazz language by looking at one of my jazz heroes and turning it into something new. I hope there's something useful in it for you or anyway that you've enjoyed watching this video. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or look, look up one of my albums on iTunes or Spotify and most of all, I hope we will get out of this health crisis soon to be able to see each other again on stage or elsewhere. So take care.